Hello everyone, my name is Jen and welcome to The Book Refuge. Hello and today um, I hope you have your tea or coffee ready to go because we are going to be doing a chatty video. So I put it out on my Instagram that I was going to be doing a video about things I love and things I hate in the in romance books and in the community lately. Um, and these videos, they're, al they're always a little bit like nerve wracking to do because you don't want to like piss anyone off. But then I'm like, since when do I care about that? I mean, the people who love me and appreciate my stuff, like, they'll be here for it. And the people who don't, well, I'm sure they'll make it interesting no matter what. Um, but don't worry. I'm not here to really specifically rag on any person. Like, I, none of mine have to do about a specific person. I mean, the one thing probably will because there's a specific person person who like made it blow up but we'll get to it we'll get to it um but before we dive into it i do have to say a huge thank you to my channel members who are sponsoring this video this month um one of the perks of channel membership is getting to vote on a video topic every month um also i have access to a private discord server you get early access to videos um as well as there's a monthly hangout at the highest level with me which is actually this coming weekend there will be our monthly private hangout so thank you so much to my channel members who supported this video and let's dive into this so I was first gonna just start with my things that I'm loving and hating this was um, kind of video recommendation that I get put in my video rec form every now and then um, not necessarily sometimes to talk about specific things I'm not liking and for me I rarely will make a topic about something that I dislike and just focus on that thing, right? I don't really do that, um, or I used to maybe sometimes, but I just don't. Like, I always keep my channel super positive, uh, but I went through my my video recommendation form, which by the way is in the description of every video. I have a book recommendation form and a video recommendation form um, where I get ideas for things from you guys. And so, I combined a few things because there was a couple where people were like talk about this subject or bring up this and for me that's not usually enough of a reason to make a whole video about whatever thing is being brought up but because of you know some of the recent uh, TikTok drama as well as you know there's just quarterly and seasonally and yearly changes that happen within our little romance community some of them good and some of them bad and so I thought it would be fun for for me and fun for you guys if we have a little bit of chat about this so as we go along feel free to start a topic down below um, and if you are someone who is commenting on it maybe try to find a comment where someone's already talking about that topic so we can have this kind of in a discussion form that could be great um, maybe I'll even start a couple of those down below asking a question like what do you think about this what do you think about this so we can have it within a discussion that way instead of everybody just commenting at me we can do this in a community style which I think would be good of course be respectful but everybody's opinion is welcome that doesn't mean it's always wanted so that's why be respectful right every opinion is welcomed but it's not always like we don't have to accept everything that everyone says but I know that the people at the book re book refuge will be respectful because that's the environment that I try to make for everyone. So keep that in mind as we go through the things that we love and the things that we hate. Um, and so the way I'm going to do this is we're kind of going to go back and forth. So I have my list of things I love and hate. And then I have, um, like I said, I put this out to Instagram for people to share with me. And so I have this down on my computer. I put notes about what people have said. And so if people kind of agree with some of the stuff, because I wrote mine down yesterday uh, morning before I put the questionnaires up. So it was interesting to see which of mine fit with other people's because it's nice to see the trends that everybody has, right? So let's start with something that I love because one of the things that I love <laughs> kind of matches with a few things that people hate. So this will be interesting. So one of the things that I love and have been loving lately is I love small town romance. I love it. I love series where you know, we get introduced to this small town and then we get introduced to maybe a family who lives there or a group of friends who live there. And I love that. I love that, you know, and Catherine Cowles has been really great with that. Devney Perry has that. Um, I'm loving Lena Hendricks series that's doing that. Um, I mean, pretty much like 
you know, one of those contemporary authors going right now is doing it. Elsie Silver has that. Um, and I love when we get to know a family and, you know, there's always that one that you get really excited for their book. And so you keep reading the series and it keeps going. And sometimes it's annoying when the author makes you wait for who you want, but that also shows like they did a really good job. Because if you aren't anticipating them so much, well, then they didn't do that great of a job. Um, something that also goes along with my small town is that I really love um, single dad romances. <laughs> And one of the people under things that I hate said that they hate the single dad trope and right now every new release seems to be a single dad trope. Now, well, I will agree that things tend to go in waves like that and, you know, try to think of a single, try, or try to think of a small town series that doesn't have a single dad or a single mom in it because I bet you won't find one. <laughs> it is literally the trope that fits within that one. And that, honestly, that's just how things go. But even to broaden it, like try to think of a romance series with like interconnected standalones that's not, I mean, even one that's a new adult, think even one that's like a college setting, one of those people is going to be a single parent, okay? They just are, whether it was like an accidental pregnancy or it's a divorced or a widowed, one of them is going to be a single parent and there's going to be a nanny or there's going to be the town coming together. That's just how it goes. Now, luckily for me, I love that. And that's probably always going to be my favorite book within the series is the one where there's a single parent. I just love it because I've shared this before when I've made videos with those recommendations. I love seeing that parent-child dynamic and then someone else coming in who that's not their child, whether it's the man or the woman, if, when that's not their child, them growing to love that child just as much as their own. I just eat that stuff up. I, I love that because I love the idea of the packaged deal. You know, like you're not just getting, um, you're not just getting the love. You're also getting a child with it as well. I don't know. I just like that. That's not going to be uh, everyone's cup of tea, but for me, that's the goods right there. I just love it. So I've been loving all the small town romance series. I haven't loved um, every one that every author does, but some of my favorites, I love Melanie Harlow. She's been doing small town like her whole career. I love those. I have been enjoying, um, like I said, Lena Hendricks series right now. Um, I am also enjoying, um, what's the other one I just read? I just started Corinne Michaels series that just started. I love that one. So those are some that I've really been enjoying. And again, I've loved small town romance for ages. So that's not something that is going to change for me. So now let's do something that one of you guys love. Um, so I had quite a few of you say that you really love all of the di diversity, disability, and mental health rep that has been in. And I have you know, I had quite a few people say that, and I absolutely agree as well. I just read Out on a Limb. I really liked that. Um, and I just love how much, uh, you know, there. there's also uh, Chloe Lee has been putting disabilities in her series that she has. Um, and there's just been more like diversity within that as well. And I feel like it fits pretty naturally because, you know, as people, we are diverse. So it's definitely not unrealistic that we would have, um, you know, diversity in our romance. We, it should match the way that our lives are. And they're all those things, you know, I've seen some, you know, recent releases in the past couple of years also representing chronic pain, being more aware that a lot of people live with that. So yeah, I definitely agree. I love seeing the diversity that is being put in pretty, uh, liberally anyway. All right, now let's do something that I strongly dislike or hate, okay? So this is also, um, I mean, we'll just get it out of the way. Everyone wants me to talk about it and you all want to talk about it because quite a few of you brought it up. Now, I have some interesting thoughts on it, which is part of the reason why I was like, I wanted to fit this into a video that had other stuff in it um, because I think the whole situation was a huge mess and there are parts of it that I think are black and white <laughs> and there are parts of it that I think that the internet let it run away and then just enjoyed the pile on for it. And I mean, of course, talking about the Seattle Krakens um, and versus a TikToker who 
got a little overzealous with her appreciation of the team. And it has ended up making book talk look bad and unfortunately as a spillover book readers because of course you know a lot of publications that ended up picking this up because it got way over the top um a lot of that that got over the top also you know it spilled over to the media because it was having to do with sports and you know people within the sports um, community aren't going to just be like, oh, those people are just having fun. They're going to be like, what the hell is up with those weirdos lusting after people? You know what I mean? Um, if you're not familiar with the whole situation, I will, if I can remember, I'll link a couple videos I think went into it fully with not too much judgment. Um, but what ended up coming out of it that I absolutely like stand by that I think there was no like room for blurring on is that it may have been, I won't say okay, but it may have been tolerated by uh, this athlete and his wife to a certain degree. And yeah, there's proof that she was like, honey, these people are lusting after you. Like, they think you're real hot stuff. And she might be like, yeah, my husband deserves this appreciation. But the moment when the woman decided, you know, they both decided like, this is going too far. This is being brought up to us by our family members and by people we see in public are now making comments like this and it has made us uncomfortable. Like their consent is now withdrawn. And the thing to do with the videos in the past, like there was this brought up is, you know, this TikToker was like, I made these videos back in April. I'm sorry. And the person's like, yeah, but that's the thing. It's on the internet and it gets brought up in our faces every day. So it doesn't matter that it was done, you know, five, six months ago. It now lives on the internet. And we now have to deal with the ramifications of it every day. And so, and that's how a lot of things go that get out of hand. You know, you think about it. Think about, and I'm, you know, I'm not saying how this is good or bad, but there's a lot of people who get canceled or, or for things that happened a long time ago. It's not always something that happens in the moment and people jump on top of it. It's a lot of times something you did a long time ago where maybe you even think completely differently about something now than you did then, but that thing gets brought up that you talked about it then, like, and now it's being used against you now. So that's why, like, we need to be as cognizant as possible of what we're putting out there. That is kind of a reason why I don't like to make much negative content, number one, because I don't like to dwell on negative things, but number two... I don't want to have to go back through my entire backlog of 1,200 videos and look for any time that I stepped out of line a little bit, you know, and if I keep my content focused on the books and focused on how I feel, well, then that's usually going to be stuff that I can stand by forever, right? Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked by this because bringing it back around, they are allowed to withdraw their consent of wanting this to stop at any time. You know, and, you know, one of the things people brought up in the things they hate, the fact that grown ass people don't understand consent. Well, I think that's the thing. That is the thing about entertainment and, um, and like celebrity and parasocial relationships is it doesn't feel real to you, right? You don't see this sports person in real life. You don't see this actor in real life. You don't talk to this singer every day. And even though you might spend hours and hours and hours with them in your head, you know, listening to their music, watching their stuff, you know, uh, cheering them on at a sports team, you don't know that person. And when we sexualize, objectify, or, you know, glorify and worship someone we've made our hero or made our idol or made our sexual object, we don't see them as a person anymore. And so it doesn't feel like they have anything they need to consent to because we've made them an object of our mind. But that's the issue. And this is where what I put as something I hate. I didn't just put this situation. On my list, I said, fan casting real people into our fictional lives to an unhealthy degree. Because when you completely sexualize someone and objectify them, it's one thing if you do that in your head, or what do we say? Like, let's say you've made that person the desire of your spank bank or something. Okay, let's just, let's just say that's, that's what, that's what is happening on TikTok when they film these you know, when there is these lusty videos or the, what's it called? I literally forgot. Uh, what's it called? The something trap, thirst trap. When these thirst trap videos are made, that's what's being done, right? And it can be funny. Sometimes it can be fun. But if that's what we're doing to that person and that person doesn't want that, and even if they don't mind, 
are they really consenting to everything you're thinking and doing about them? And now, I don't mean to make this like more than it is. This isn't about having a moral lesson or anything. But when we do that with people who actually exist, and then we talk about them like they're a fictional person and we, you know, idolize them and we fan cast them into our books, I feel like we are removing a certain amount of their personhood that they didn't consent to. Because even if they're okay with having their picture out there, even if they were okay with that video being filmed because it's part of their contract or it's part of this or whatever, they can still be uncomfortable knowing that people are whacking off to them or making uh, videos talking about filling all of their holes, right? So I think it's a bigger like issue, but also one that's kind of impossible to get to the very base level of it. The only thing that we can police or shame is the stuff that gets put in public. How many people are still having those thoughts and thinking those things and, you know, doing those things to that person in their mind at home that that person can never say anything about because it's just, it's out there. It's there. Um, I don't know. Again, this gets into so much more, but that's also why when I see everyone freaking out about it and saying like, behave better or um, you should know better or, oh, people don't know the consent is I was like, I think our brains have been trained to just accept that. You know, there was something that I saw done that very much disturbed me. Okay. It really disturbed me. There was a picture of Henry Cavill from the cover of a men's magazine that someone had used AI to adjust his package to an insane degree. So it looked like he had a super ginormous cock in his pants and they'd made this picture huge and someone would be like, oh my God. And it was like, that was an altered photo. And I had, you know, seen something where people are talking about how Henry was really uncomfortable with that being done to him. Number one, you know, I'm not saying that Henry Cavill is the most sympathetic person out there. I think that he has a bit too much taste for young women in an unhealthy way, and it's made me not very comfortable visualizing anyone as Henry Cavill anymore. Um, that's my own personal view on it. He still doesn't deserve to be objectified in a way he didn't consent to. Just because he's a celebrity, and he's been in movies, and he's been on magazine covers, he consented to all of those. He has paid for all of those. When you take his image and you make it into this sexual object that he didn't consent to be on, that isn't a photo he consented to be a part of someone's big cock dreams of Henry Cavill, we have now like separated him from his personhood. And that's another form of like non-consensual thing that nobody like wants to talk about. Again, what I don't like about this is that this was a situation that's like, yes, this hockey player is a celebrity, but he's, he's still like, he's doing a job. He's in a sport. And like, I was more deserved. Again, one of the videos I'm going to try to remember to link is that, yeah, he was having, you know, videos and photos taken of him by his job, but he didn't necessarily know what they were probably using those for until a lot of this spiraled out of control. And someone in a comment on this video pointed out how would you feel as a woman if your work was taking these pictures and videos of you and using them to feed lusty men's imaginations of you and you were just doing your job? You know, like if you were a, you know, and I know some people don't like the comparison of like, what if he was a woman, but I'm sorry, that is what equality is about is we want the same jobs that men have and we should be treated the same way and of, of equality. And so if this was a woman volleyball player and every time she was jumping and bouncing and her work had taken videos and slowed them down and was popping them out as thirst traps so men could lust over her tits jiggling around or her groin stretches she's doing um, or doing like stretches popping down to the ground, like, you know, I think people were outraged for some stuff happening to Alex, but I also think they weren't outraged about it until the wife said, I'm upset about it, you know? Like, I don't know. So again, to me, I'm not so much just calling out this one person. She's not the first person who's made one of these things. She's not the first person. She's just like the one that, you know, unfortunately got a little singled out by this. And I, I agree with the wife where she was like, I wasn't just pointing out the one person. She just happens to be the biggest person that that's happened with. And you can see how viral her videos went and just how awful that would be, right? And very easily these things lead over to harassment because then someone speaks up about it and everyone's like, you get paid this much money, you should just have to deal with it. Excuse me? 
So because you make millions of dollars, you deserve to be like abused and like it's ab like objectified and abused and you know, people be able to make comments about you filling their holes and saying that you're cheating on your wife and your wife's insecure because she's uncomfortable. Like it's just, it's a mess. And I know, I know most of y'all agree. I don't think any of you are just gonna be like, eh. But my point is too, I'm not completely just blaming this one TikToker. I think that she became something everyone could centralize it on and hate on her and say like, oh, she's making us all look bad and it's her when it's like, it's not just her. She's just the most popular one that did it. We've all done it. Okay. We've, we've literally all done it. I've literally done it. I have posters of people in my home, you know, like we've all done it. So for me more, I hate that we do that, that we fan cast real people into situations like this. And then they lose some of their humanity to us because they're just an object that fits into a book which is a fictional person, but they're not a fictional person. They're a real person who has rights, who has personhood, and shouldn't be devolved down to their sexual parts. Okay? All right. See, I knew I'd spent a long time on that one because there's a lot. And again, I don't have a solution. I just, I don't like it. I think it was icky. I think it ended up making the book community look bad. But again, in some aspects, I think some of us needed this brought to our attention. I think we needed a little bit of mud on our face to remember that people's unique personhood matters and they're not just our sexual objects for our spank banks. Um, I'm just saying, it's true. And that is why like when we fall in love with fictional characters that don't have any representation in real life, that that is a little bit safer in my opinion when, you know, I'll focus in on Henry Blackwater who doesn't actually exist. So there we go. Anyway. Let's do something else I love, because I knew that one was going to be intense, but, you know, please share your thoughts on it as well. Keep it clean, keep it decent. I, like, my opinion is I'm not focusing in on anyone to hate on it. I just hate the situation, and that it got completely blown out of the place, and I don't know. Someone also mentioned that Emily Rath, like, yeah, I watched her videos on that. I think she put herself in the position to get drugged down into this, because I'm sorry, authors who write hockey romance... The hockey romance existed before this issue and it will exist afterwards and there was no reason to hate on her but I also think she got very holier than thou about it before it all broke down. Okay, I watched quite a few of her videos on it and I mean I'm sorry that it all like came on her but I also think she put herself in the position to be an authority on some stuff and so then people were like come crashing on her for it and I can't even imagine the emotions of all that like dumping down on you and it's why I want to like stay out of all of it. You know what I mean? All right. Okay. Some things that I love. Let's see. One for me. I love that this was a very specific thing and I hope that it will be a trend. Um, I love that some authors are still keeping man covers alongside their discreet covers. So one of my recent favorite things that happened, and I will be very specific about it, is that Melanie Harlow brought back the man chest covers. I'm so happy this happened. So with her new series, with the first one, Runaway Love, when Runaway Love was announced, she wrote this thing about, I'm so sorry, this one is just going to have a discreet cover. Look at how cute it is. Don't mind this. It's beautiful. Um, but we won't be having man chests anymore. I, I don't need to have two of them. I can't afford to have two. Whatever her reasons were. Um, she only had the one cover of Runaway Love and I was very vocal on my channel that I did not like that and me who I've owned the last 15 Melanie Harlow books that have come out, I would not be buying a physical copy of that book because I just felt, I mean, I know that wasn't her purpose and I've said again and again that I understand the like authors, like what they have to do for their finances. I understand because an author is rarely just their own business. Usually they have PAs and their family and children to put through college and all these things. But I know that my dollar and my voice means something. That is a weird thing for me, but it's true. And even you who maybe don't have a channel or don't talk about stuff anywhere, you have a voice and it's called your money. You know, it is. And for me, I was not going to purchase a book that I felt that an author who made such beautiful covers and always had, you know, she recently had offered two options of stuff, um, that people, you know, that I wouldn't have the option. Cause I was like, it's fine if you only offer, you know, one cover, 
but when you are someone who has always offered beautiful covers and then you take it away and you're like, I'm sorry, it's not doing good enough, it really felt like a slap in the face to people who want sexy covers on books and who want their book covers to represent what's inside of them. You know, there's a lot to be said for beautiful, discreet covers. Like, I really love these vintage ones from Lena Hendricks. I really think those are beautiful. I bought these covers instead of the other ones. But there is always the option with her to also have... Come on, book. To also have a cover like this. Because I think this is beautiful. And I liked this one better than the one for One Look. Um, so anyway... This is about stuff that I love. So recently with the cover reveal for her next book, which actually just came out the day that I'm filming this and I already snatched up a copy of that one, she is going back to Manchest covers. So she revealed two covers for this book and I was so happy. I, you know, and I immediately started posting about the book, sharing it everywhere. I said I'll be buying a copy of this book. Um, I can't wait to read it. I pre-ordered the book, um, and I did read Runaway Love, but I only read that on KU, um, whereas this one I literally got, like, three versions of it. I'm gonna get the audiobook as soon as it comes out, um, and yeah, I can't wait for all of those. Um, so this was something that I love. I love that, you know, and in her thing, she's like, we're getting back together. We'll offer both options. So, you know, maybe she tried and it didn't work as well as she wanted. Um, I mean, Melanie Harlow still does really good, but I think that maybe we were heard with enough people saying like, I still love your books, but I want to have the option to have the Sexy Man chest. And so she not only released the Sexy Man chest cover of this one, but she also back checked and you can get the sexy cover of Runaway Love as well, which is nice. Like, look at that cover. That is fantastic. So that is something that I love and I love to see it so much. Let me see if anyone else wrote something that they love about covers. Nope, I don't think anyone did. A lot of you, although... It is something that I hate and we all know it, so I won't uh, go into mine too much, but something that you guys hated is you are tired of flower covers, you're tired of only discreet covers, tired of, um, let's see, what else did someone say? So tired of flowers specifically on discreet covers. Um, let me see. Yeah, flower covers written again. <laughs> yeah, so you guys all agree with me. You uh, hate that as well. So I'm very happy that she did that. That's specifically something that I love. So let's do something else that I love since I had focused a lot on stuff that I hate. And I really only have one more thing that I hate to get into. So we're going to do something I love. Um, I love the shorter audiobook window that has been for some authors. Um, some authors have really been pushing to, to do the day and date release of those. Like Corinne Michaels had it available right away. Um, Elsie Silver has been having it available right away. Um, I know that's not possible for all indie authors because they have to be pretty far ahead of their schedule to do this. Maggie Cole is able to do this. Um, who else has been able to do it? There, there's other people, of course, but I really love that that window has been getting pretty shorter. I mean, Sarah Kate has a pretty tight turnaround for hers. JT Geisinger has a pretty tight turnaround for hers. Um, I just really love seeing that that some indie authors are realizing that it's a great accessibility. Also, for contemporary books, I usually want the audiobook more. You know, like I pre-ordered the audiobook for the Corinne Michaels. I was so excited for that story and I knew that based on the narrators I was going to want that one. Um, so yeah, that's something that I love. I love that I'm able to get those as soon as I am. Okay, and then the last thing I want to mention that I hate and I know that a lot of you guys agreed with me for this. I know it's been something people have been um, coming across lately and really kind of the the siren has been sounded about it so we'll see what you know we'll see how long it takes for the authors to come back from that because I really think TikTok has done this so what am I talking about right I'm talking about sex scenes not fitting the story or really crazy wild sex being put into a book that it doesn't fit with it um, or you know kinks being thrown in that there's no background for it happening at all um, and, and the thing is, this is like a tough one for me because I have no shame about reading as kinky as we want to go. You know, I'm a no shame zone here. I like all kinds of kinks. I like it there. But the thing is, 
I love romance more than I love kink or really sexy or spicy things. And if you write me a very powerful, deep, heartfelt romance that is a one or a two on the spice scale, I'm going to love that book just as much as a five star spicy thing. And in fact, I will love it even more than a book that just solely relies on the slap and the tickle and the choke me and the gag me with your cock and all that stuff, which I know that TikTok has made those lines viral for a lot of authors with the dirty sounds being plain and all that stuff. And so authors feel like they need to have those lines in their book so that they can use them in a teaser. So that can be on some bookstagram's photo that does spicy Saturdays or does, you know, saucy Sundays or whatever they're doing. And honestly, when I read those sayings now, I'm like, is that what that hero would actually say? Like, how come every hero in a small town romance as soon as they're taking their clothes off, he's like, I'm going to throw you against the wall and choke you on my cock. And I'm like, but would that hero actually do that? Because here's the thing. I for sure want to read this couple getting down and dirty. Like I really do. I don't, I don't really want to read clean romance. I don't really want to read nothing happening. But is it built into the character of this couple that that's the kind of sex they're going to be happening? Or are you just throwing it in there because you need to fit a quota? Like, I really want authors to be writing the sex that fits. And I know that I've brought up specific authors before, and I don't want to turn this into that because I'm not trying to turn it into a, like, hate on this author for doing it. Because, again, so many things are just authors trying to survive. That's why they're offering discrete covers for everything. It's why they're trying to get their audiobooks out. Like, they have to do what they have to do to make enough money for them and their families. And I stick with this. What I really push it towards is like, why is that what people are picking out? Why aren't we looking for the swoony quotes to share? Why aren't we looking for the like, look at this moment, this person was being so vulnerable to show that as romance. Romance does not always equal sex. There can be a beautiful romance that doesn't have it. I go back to one of the very, very early video that I made. Literally, the definition of a romance is just that it has a happily ever after. Literally, all the way back to Greek times. There was Greek tragedies and there was romances slash comedies. Those are the two types of stories that were like first created. Either it has a happily ever after, happy for now, or whatever, or it doesn't, right? Now, in different subgenres, that doesn't always mean that it's like, people kissing and getting married at the end, it can just mean that we solved it, the murderer was caught, or, ah, oh, this was a great, like, fantasy, we defeated the evil, like, that can be the HEA, because we defeated, we won, but in romance, it just means we need to be together by the end, it does not equal, he has to have a nine-inch dick and he bangs her against the wall, it does not have to be that, and I think that you know, just because we see the most like hype for those, I don't always think people are like satisfied with that. I don't think they are. Like I was looking at, you know, when you look at my list of my six star reads for the year, half of them are pretty low on the spice because it was the connection. It was the swooniness. It was the romance that did it. Some of them are erotic romance. Yes, they are. But the way that they worked for me is that the author that was the type of story. Like, Minx, it's an erotic romance. So, yeah, it's going to have a lot of sex in it. But because it's an erotic romance, every sex scene has to push the romance forward. It isn't just that there's pet play in that that makes it erotic. It's how did this pet play break down their barriers and make these people a raw open person to the other one and they were able to reach in and connect with the other person and that's what makes that sex so satisfying that's what makes that story shake me to my core is the way that this couple was connecting through sex when you're having a you know small town romance a lot of the times it's not the sex that's driving the story forward it's their connections it's that um that's her brother's best friend it's that she's his nanny and he's watching her take care of his daughter and that is what's drawing him closer to her and making them fall in love and then yeah they're gonna have some dirty time behind the door but that's not what makes the romance powerful it might make it more enjoyable, but it shouldn't be what you're relying on your story to push it forward. And so for me, what I do dislike, I might not hate the book, I might not give it a two star for doing this, but when you throw in some of those scenes just because, I think it can take away from your story if you haven't set it up to fit 
together. If you've just thrown in those spicy things because you're like, oh, it's time for a sex scene. I need to pull out all my bags of tricks to make sure this has people stunned. And I'm like, well, maybe this couple is just going to have sweet, sweet missionary sex under the blanket, but it's going to be so romantic because they are so in love with each other that all they need to be doing is looking into each other's eyes when they orgasm for it to be the best scene in the book, you know? So I don't love that a lot of things that I enjoy in sexy scenes are being put in just every book because then it doesn't make them special, right? You know, I do these oddly specific rec videos or um, taboo rec videos to point out really like specific sexy things because they were rare. Well, now every hero is putting his hand on the woman's throat. Now every hero is slapping her ass when he turns her over and then it doesn't even stand out anymore. It doesn't even make you flinch and it desensitizes us to things and it doesn't make us feel the impact of it then when it happens in a story where it does fit, like it would be there, you know? And I've said, like, it's not that I only think the dirty stuff should show up in dark romances, um, because dark romance doesn't necessarily equal any spicier or more erotic. Dark romance is about the content that it's about, not about the sexual acts that happen within it. So as someone who is a huge advocate for good spicy books, I still want it to be done with discretion and done in the proper places, right? Because if you are a talented writer, you will make your book just as emotional and connecting to me. If there's only one sex scene in it, then you will if the whole thing is sex, right? Because then where was the romance in it? So, and a lot of you pointed this out too. So some people said, um, one of these was, uh, la, 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 new releases are so formulaic. It has to fit into exactly, you know, what people are expecting it to be. Um, some books are getting a little thin on plot and they're just trying to outdo each other with a smut. Um, some authors just don't know the difference between insta love and insta lust. That is so true. Um, personally, is the delicate line between romance and erotica. We need books that know the difference. Um, let's see, what else do people say having to do with that? The lack of emotional development between the hero and heroine just moving right into sex. Yep. And... Too much dirty talk by the hero or heroine that doesn't fit the characters. Yep, someone knows me. Someone knows me. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, I know you guys agree with me. Also, because it's something I've talked about on my channel. Crystal has talked about it on her channel. Jessen's been mentioning it in some of her reviews, too. So, you know, I know that it's not just me. Granted, I did have this first pointed out by someone else. Because it was something that I wouldn't put a name on what was happening. I would just be like, oh, that one felt off. So it would just, you know, get a four, three or a four star instead of a five. And I wouldn't really know why. And then when someone points it out to me, now I've started to notice it. And I really notice it in these new releases. And so if this is going to be a new release that has some really dirty scenes in it, am I seeing the author lay the groundwork? Like, am I seeing that the hero is a bit edgier like this so that when we get in the bedroom it fits his character that he's gonna call her a good girl oh my god the amount of books where he just says good girl for no fucking reason i'm just like why are you calling her a good girl why you know like why why is that the only saying we can say now in the bedroom is good girl like praise did it okay we know praise did it and so now everyone's doing it right and also i come back to Again, authors are writing the trend. When we get sick of the trend, when we say we're getting tired of it, then the authors will change it up. That's how it goes. There's going to be some lag time. So we just have to keep pointing it out. We have to keep pointing it out in the new releases that were like, hey, I like this story. Then they got in the bedroom and like, what was this? Um, because then the authors will know that they have permission to pull back a little bit, right? So the thing, you know, when I make these about like things that I hate within this, you know, things that are annoying me, I see it start to show up in the reviews of books that I'm reading. The authors will see that and they will make the adjustment because they want their books to keep selling well. So that's the thing is we're noticing it a bunch now because this is the aftermath of what was happening the past couple of years of what was happening on TikTok and those books getting blown up and those authors getting contracts with publishing companies. So indie authors looking for that for themselves and hoping to catch some of the audience of those people, they're putting it into their books. 
So now we have to make clear what we want again so that the market can correct. That's how it works. We have to talk about the books that do it the right way. We have to uphold the authors who do the stories the way that we want and buy their books and support them and talk about them so the change can happen. We can't just bitch and keep it to ourselves and be like, oh, the romance is coming out now or trash. Well, we are in control of that to a certain degree, right? Because the authors aren't going to keep writing that if they're not going to make money. Because again, they need to feed their families, so they're going to follow where it goes, okay? Is that enough of Capitalism 101 and stuff for you? Okay, let's move, let's move it on um, to a couple more of things I love, and then I'll read off a few of the last things that you guys said, because this video is pushing it. I knew it would, because I knew I had a lot to say. That's why I was saving it to fit into one video. So what I've been loving, this one goes back to what I've been loving. I've been loving some of the readathons I've been a part of. Um, I have planned a few. I've been a part of a few. So this year so far, I have had the Romance Takeover Readathon. That is one that I do twice a year, every year for the past uh, three years. I love it. It's amazing. I've also been a part of both the Kindle Unlimited Readathon and there's been a couple like weekend readathons that some of my friends on Instagram have done. I love those. We had the Fan Fiction Readathon, which just started last year and I did it again this year and it was such a rewarding thing to be a part of. I love it so much. And then I have missed there not being a historical romance readathon. I think that has kind of like devolved a little bit and Lacey, Lisa, and Jess haven't been able to do that. Historical romance is going through a moment of not being its full potential lately, which has been sad. But this month, the month of August, um, there are some people who are hosting the romance readathon. Now it is for all romance and really any book that you read during the month counts, which I love that kind of setup because it allows me to still read the books that I have to read for my monthly stuff. But also you get bonus points for reading like historical romance or BIPOC authors. So that's been so much fun. So I've been loving the readathons. I'm really enjoying this one too because I didn't plan it and I'm not hosting it. Um, I wasn't able to make that work, but I really like just getting to be a part of a readathon that is this well planned and thought out. It makes me want to plan more when I do mine, but also it makes my brain hurt all the work that Maggie's put into this and all the hosts are doing with it. Like it literally makes my brain ache because I would not be that cool. I wouldn't be able to do it, but I'm just absolutely loving that so much. So really happy to be a part of those. All right. So let's go through a few more things that you guys uh, well, let's do hate. We'll do a few more things that you guys hate, but I'm just going to kind of list them and then we'll end with things I love. So we started and ended with things we love. I try to keep it as positive as possible. So a few more things that you guys hate. Someone said the oversaturation of rom-coms, trad publishing, it seems like that's all they focus on. That is a good point. And again, I think it also fits into everybody wanting cartoon covers. So like, I don't know, to me, cartoon covers used to be that it was like a rom-com or even, I mean, even it could be women's fiction, but that's what it was. And now you never know. So it feels like everything's rom-com, you know, for sure. Um, let's see. Someone else said, when reviewers hate on an infant, the female main character, when authors write realistic re reactions to things. Well, that's, that's fair. I'll give you that. I think sometimes we would react a way that an author writes. But I don't know. I also think that authors don't think that through totally well and have them completely jump off the thing. So fair enough. You're allowed your opinion on that. You're allowed your opinion on that. Um, special editions you spend so much money on and then they end up just looking like a discreet cover. Ooh, that one definitely has some truth to it for sure. You know, if I buy a, if I am buying one of the special editions of something and it costs me 50 to a hundred dollars, which, you know, I definitely have paid for. And then it is just a flower cover of a book. Like I've been a little disappointed with Fabled Co, which is funny. One book I love by them, they did Knotted, which I won't grab down, but that one has a dust jacket and underneath it is a beautiful, like beautiful. I'm so glad I got that book. Then the next couple months that I got from them is literally just flower covered books that doesn't distinguish it at all. That is beautiful. It has different sides on both sides. It's gorgeous. The other ones I've gotten from them, I'm like, what is this? Yeah, you put it in a hard case, but it's just flowers. The original cover of the book has flowers on it. I'm thinking of the one by Katarina Mara. I had gotten a copy of her newest release when I went to Book Bonanza. It's 
pretty. It's a pretty book cover. And then I got this special edition and it's just more flowers, but they're like in, in like rose gold foil, which I mean is pretty, but it's like, you didn't do anything original or unique with it. It's just more flowers. So yeah, that's, that's a unique one for sure. Special editions are already so expensive. And it's like, if you're not going to do something unique with it, why do I have to pay so much for it? I totally get that. Um, let's see if there's anything else I want to mention. La, 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 la. Um, when sexual assault or rape is used to give a character more character growth. <laughs> yeah, that is intense. This is a good one. People hating on Colleen Hoover. She is a gateway author to many people for romance. That is a good point, by the way. I don't talk about Colleen Hoover. I don't read her books. I don't actually plan to read her books, but then again, I don't need the gateway. I've got my gateway other ways. You know, after going to Book Bonanza this year and seeing how many of the people literally were only there for Colleen Hoover, um, or even like, uh, uh, E.L. James was there too, wasn't she? Yeah, I think E.L. James was there. And they are, they are gateway authors for so many people and they deserve the respect they did. And the work that Colleen Hoover is doing, the money they've raised for charity through Book Bonanza, I know we get excited, those of us who go, because we want the special editions and we want to meet authors, but you know, it's no joke what they've, the work they've put in and what they've done. Like, it's no joke. And she does deserve respect. Like, I absolutely have respect for her, even if I don't feel like her books are romance and that she definitely did kind of, like, squeeze into it. Like, I don't feel like she's completely done that. I feel like that's where TikTok put her, and then because it was working, they just ran with it. So, yeah, I definitely think she doesn't deserve the hate people try to throw. Um, oh, also this one, books being ridiculously long now. Yeah, that is a thing. And I, maybe some of you know this for sure, but um, because of the uh, Amazon ban some people were trying to do, Kindle Unlimited lost a lot of subscribers near the beginning of the year. So when the next quarter numbers for Kindle Unlimited came out, authors are getting paid even less per page than they were before. So let's just use this example. Let's say a book was 400 pages, and if you read all the way through their book, this is just an example. Let's say the author made like a dollar 65 for you reading every page of their book. Um, now let's say they're only making like 75 cents or 90 cents if you read their whole book that was 400 pages. So if they need to be making the same income they were making before, you know, an author might need their book to be 650 pages or something. And I'm not saying every author is doing that, but I have seen for sure like some formatting change a little bit. Like books on Amazon, the ebook will say that it's like 600 pages, but then like the physical book will only be like 430 pages. And yeah, that is, that's an unfortunate thing authors have to do. But at the same time, if they have to game the system a little bit, I'm okay with it. I just don't necessarily like if the book, you know, like if you have to change the formatting a little bit to give yourself some page length, does that make sense? I don't mind if they have to do that because I want the authors that I love to still get paid enough that they can keep going. But when they actually write the book to be that long, I'm like, you definitely fluffed your pages with this. So that was too much. Okay, so now let's end off with some other things that you guys love. And we'll round this video out at over 50 minutes here. <laughs> so um, someone said, I love that I found my people in this community. I love hearing that. That's beautiful. Loving some low angst romances. Sometimes I just need to feel comfortable with it. Love that asexual main characters and discussions about that. Love that. Um, reading books where the FMC is the villain. Ooh, I love that. That's cool. That's cool. Um, loving all of the love for indie authors. Um, loving complexity, communication between characters, um, found family, reverse age gaps, representa representation of all kinds has been making leaps. Um, so yeah, those are some other things you guys love. So yeah, thank you guys so much for showing up to this. Um, thanks for putting up with some of my saucy takes on some things, but that's what you were in for with this video. I appreciate it so much. Again, thank you to my channel members for supporting this. And also thank you to my patrons. If you would like to support my channel here, I have the link to my Patreon down below as well as channel memberships. 
where I said you get lots of different benefits and access to different behind the scenes content. Thank you so much for watching this video and I'll see you next time. Bye.